Okay. Um, so the project is very similar to what you did for your semester exam, except this time you are doing it by, by yourself in so much as um, you are going to create over the next week, week and a half uh, problems, just like Mr. Klein and I created the problems at the semester exam where, you know, there were too many mosquitoes and so, you know, what are you going to do in your West African country? There's a lot of mosquitoes and whatever, whatever, right? We created those problems and then you solve them with your partner. This time, for at least the first part of this project, you're going to come up with problems. You have, at this point, um, done research on a least developed country and a highly developed country. You're going to choose, you're going to use those so you already have some foundation. Um, and so for your least developed country, you're going to come up with five problems. Am I saying this right? Fine. And for your highly developed country, you'll come up with five. So you'll have a total of 10 problems that you will come up with over the next week and a half. They need to be just like what you saw in the semester exam. They need to be detailed, thoughtful kinds of uh, They need to be thoughtful, sort of detailed this is what's happening and we're going to show some and uh that, that, that these all of this stuff is going to be shared in in schoology so for client and my students it'll be in the folder um called passport project or something like that so um anything else i'm missing on like setup uh we're going to like working with people oh right yeah yeah, yeah. so th so essentially how this is going to work is you you come up with your total of 10 problems and then you're just going to pass them down the line okay bang goes to maddie maddie to mary and mary to luna luna to annabelle and so it's just gonna like you just are going to pass your problems down the line you with me so that what's what we don't want to have happen i don't want van to give maddie Van's problems and Maddie give Van Maddie's problems, right? We're, we're trying, we don't want that to happen. So in other words, you're going to have problems from somebody and you're going to give your problems to somebody else. Okay. So, this, this is not, so you're not even really working with anybody, but when you come up with your problems, you're going to give your problems to, um, so Van would give Maddie Van's problems, and Van will also give Maddie all of her research. So, you know, you did all the different, uh, what were your countries, Van, just real quick, just as an example. Okay, that's Argentina. Great. So when you did Argentina, you accumulated like birth rates, death rates, education level, all of those things, all those demographic things, and you came up with some articles for Argentina. You're going to share all of that with Maddie. So everything you have on Argentina plus your five problems go to Maddie. And that gives Maddie some place to start. She, she, she will obviously have to fill it out to solve the problems. She will obviously have to find more research and stuff, but she's not starting from ground. She's not starting from nothing. She's going to have some foundation through the work that Van has done. Does that make sense? All right. Um, this sort of explains the stages. And again, it will be on Schoology. Um, so um, it's, I think, at this point, pretty self-explanatory. We're going to do now, we're going to role play two problems, which when at the end of April, last week in April, you will come up, just you, and you will interview Klein or myself, whoever you have. And just kind of like with the final exam, you will have answered uh, 10 problems, right? We will then say, all right, Van, you've answered these 10 problems. 
we want to hear a problem from this section and a problem from this section from a highly developed and a low developed country. We want to hear how you solve those problems. And that's it. I mean, if you do well on those two, you're done. If you break one of the problems, if you don't do well on one of the problems, then you have eight other problems to choose from to try to redeem yourself. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So the scoring on that, so the and, and we're going to demonstrate this in just a minute, right? Because there are two grades. There's the grade of the problem and there's the grade of your response to the problem. All right. Van comes up with a problem on Argentina and gives it to Maddie. Right. We are judging Maddie on her response to that problem, but we're judging Van on the creation of the problem. You with me? So there's really no connection. And, and, and if, and we will be able to tell, like if the, if the problem is, and we're going to again, demonstrate this in a minute. If the problem is sub, if the problem is set up in a substandard way, we, we will know that going in and realize that that is uh, handicapping the person answering the problem. Okay. All right. So the first problem that we're going to do is a highly developed, uh, a highly developed country, the United States. The problem is the school to prison pipeline. And Klein came up with this problem. You want to read it? Klein? Yeah. So in this scenario, I have spent the past X amount of time working on this problem. I've done my research. My country was the United States. I have all my demographic data, I have all of my information, my GDP, I've got everything mapped out and leveled out. And I come to developing my question. And I know a lot about this country because I've spent a lot of time studying it over the course of the past you know, several months. I have identified a multifaceted and nuanced question, but I had to come up at it in a way where my comrade, my partner here who's going to get this question has like a degree of a range that they can react. I'm not going to say come in and fix something, you know, the United States reliance on food or something stupid. You know what I mean? It's got to be a very like identifiable and solution based problem that is manageable to make this thing a realistic looking and, you know, uh, reasonable question. I'm going to give him a position. These are the powers that you have. The question that I wrote is uh, school to prison pipeline. And this is how I worded it. Many of the incarcerated populations within the United States have their first run in with law enforcement in primary and secondary school. Many students are targeted and profiled based on their socioeconomic status. How can you solve this problem? That's a huge problem. So I give him a position. You are limited in your ability to respond as there is a patchwork of jurisdictions that oversee correctional facilities and procedures in the United States. Your role is the presidential appointed education secretary. So everything within the capacity of the education secretary, those are the available options, right? I also put a caveat. Uh, you work at the pleasure of the president. The president is an elected official who is very mindful of things like midterms and public opinion. You have to sell this idea to the voting public. Be mindful of your messaging, right? So you've got to come out of a way to make this thing palatable for the average American public. And you've got to do it in a position where you're not essentially a god. You have to work within the confines of what powers are available to the education secretary, right? You may not know everything about the education secretary, but you can go forward from there saying like, all right, okay, the education secretary too. I can lobby this group. I can lobby this group. I need to talk to Congress. I need to find a quorum and a coalition to go along with my plan. And then I need to lay out my plan. Does that make sense? Sorry, carry away. Go ahead. Okay. So, so as the education secretary, my first two things that I immediately wanted to become aware of, 
was who in the legislative branch do I need to talk to? So what I'm presenting, what I'm about to present is geared towards being uh, given, uh, presented to Senator Patty Murray, Senator out of Washington State, who chairs the Education Committee for the U.S. Senate, and Robert Cortez Smith, House of Representatives, chair of the Education Committee out of Virginia. So I'm going to talk, to, I'm imagining that I'm talking to these two people. I'm going to start my presentation to them with statistics about incarceration, because that's, that's kind of the end. And then I'm going to work backwards into schools. So incarceration rates for men in the United States, white men, 18 and older, one in 106. Hispanic men, 18 and older, one in 54. Black men, 18 and older, one in 15. Black men, 20 to 34, one in nine. All men, 18 and older, one in 54. Women, 35 to 39, one, uh, white women, one in 355. Hispanic women, one in 297. African-American, one in 100. So we can obviously see that African-Americans are disproportionately incarcerated in this country. Um, there are about 58,000 African-Americans incarcerated in this country, which is about 38% um, of the inmates in this country are African-American, which is disproportionate to their uh, percentage of population in this country. Um, in 2020, African-Americans had the highest incarceration rate among any demographic group with 465 per 100,000. All of those statistics are eye-opening, but I am not in the business of prisons, though I will say that those numbers, you keep those numbers in your head. Now we look at public school suspensions, which is more my area as the Secretary of Education. Public school, out of school suspension for white males makes up about 5% of suspensions. White females make up about 1.7% of suspensions. Black males make up 17% of suspensions, out of school suspensions. Black females make up 9.6% of out of school suspensions. Hispanic males make up 6.4% of out of school suspensions. Um, Hispanic females make up 2.6. Native American uh, males make up 9.1%. And Native American females make up 4.5%. So again, we, then we see some very stark differences in demographics. African Americans are much more likely to be out of school suspension. They're much more likely to be held back um, in any grade K through eight, um, and 14 million students in this country go to school with a police officer, but no nurse, no social worker, and no counselor. And the vast majority of those 14 million are African American or minority or marginalized groups. The, um, Impetus for out-of-school suspension and the higher numbers came from a, a law in 1990 uh, that was originally designed to keep guns out of schools, but has then now been targeted um, to get students on more minor infractions. And those minor infractions can be anything from um, talking on their cell phone or disrespecting a teacher, and those lead to out-of-school suspensions under this law. And again, most of the people who make up those out of school suspensions are African Americans. So there is a school to prison pipeline. And just to give some numbers on that real quick, um, the zero to tolerance policy, which I just was mentioning that came out of the 1990s, has resulted in black students facing disproportionately harsher punishment than white students in public schools. 31% um, of uh, Black students or black students represent 31% of school related arrest. Black students are suspended and expelled at three times more than white students. And students suspended or expelled for discretionary violations 
are nearly three times more likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system the following year. Some examples of kids being suspended. Uh, Brian, an African-American 11th grader, had an argument with a school police officer using the restroom without a pass. The officer reportedly punched him in the face simultaneously with both fists and threw him to the ground in a chokehold. Brian is asthmatic and says, I felt like I was going to die that day. A Florida police school resource officer in uh, middle school slammed a 13-year-old boy to the ground, twisted his arm for over 40 seconds in a torque hold. The middle schooler, who weighed 84 pounds, ended up with a sprained wrist and ankle after the officer's takedown. An officer, officer in Pine Ridge Elementary handcuffed a six-year-old special needs student after the boy ran away from his classroom. The cuffs left visible bruises on the boy's skin. Um, there's, one, there's one in Tennessee I wanna make sure to mention. Uh, police, this is, these are kids six to 11. Police handcuffed and arrested 10 students ages six to 11 in Tennessee. The arrests were made because the students did not stop an off-campus fight days earlier. The children were charged with criminal neglect and uh, not, not preventing a fight. So these are all minority students. These are all examples of extreme use of police force. So I would, I would say here to the legislative branch, it is time to reconsider the zero tolerance policy law that came out of the 90s. It is time to embrace restorative justice which focuses on building relationships that cause harm and not on punitive actions that degrade a person's dignity or puts the person in contact with police at a very young age, right? Once police are seen as the enemy, once police are seen as um, someone to be feared and mistrusted that has obviously knock on effects to them later in life as well. So we need more social workers in school. We need more counselors in schools. We need less police officers in schools. And we need to focus on when there is an infraction in a class. If it's a student who is on a cell phone or it's a student who disrespects a teacher, that needs to be restorative justice to um, help that student deal with the harm and broken relationship they are suffering and uh, keep them in school because the more they miss school, uh, the more likely they are to end up in the juvenile justice system. So my, my takeaway to the two members of this com these committees would be to ad address that zero tolerance law from 1996 and to begin to create professional development and, and funding to hire more social workers and to increase uh, knowledge among teachers and counselors and administrators on restorative justice and the benefits of restorative justice. That's how I would address the prison to school pipeline. Okay. Perfect. So I think uh, what we can see from that, like, that was a lot of research, right? But you're gonna have a long time to work on all of these problems. Another thing that we're gonna show you here in just a second, if my problem, if the problem you receive isn't up to snuff, isn't very good, then it really does limit the response that you can have. Does that make sense? So I feel like that was a, to toot my own pretty good question, good response. You had a role, you had a plan moving forward, you identified key issues that you wanted solved immediately, and then you showed me what the long-term solution was going to be, right? Good solution. And I don't want to say the reason, that it, to echo what Klein said, it's good because I'm not sure, I didn't really solve the problem. I mean, it's still up to Patty Murray and Richard Smith to solve the problem, right? I gave them a suggestion which is what my capacity, capacity was, right? I, as a secretary of education, I don't necessarily get to solve problems. I get to go to Patty Murray and say, hey, Patty, let's talk. 
me and Patty have a conversation and then Patty gets to institute the change if Patty so sees fit. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so our next one is not a great problem. Okay. Um, so the country that I had, my LDC country, is Burkina Faso. My question is widespread food scarcity is creating a refugee crisis disproportionately impacting children, resulting in many people fleeing the country and creating a refugee crisis and a brain drain within the country. A lot of big words, a lot of good actionable things there. Here's the thing though, and something that I didn't address in my question, Burkina Faso just had a military coup take over their democratically elected government, right? They have huge problems. Child hunger is one of them, right? But another issue here is just basic security within the country. It's completely overrun with uh, a lack of real um, sense of security from the citizens, and they're clearly uh, struggling, and it is creating a refugee crisis. But the way that my question is worded, I do just want to try to. Yeah. So the way he's worded the question, I'm taking this question. I'm gonna I'm gonna offer two different solutions to illustrate uh, what, you what I can do with this. And neither of my solutions are going to be very good in terms of a grade. Either of these solutions would get you at best a C minus, and that probably being generous, okay? One of them would probably just get you a straight F, would get you a straight F. So my first solution could be, based on this problem, is that I'd be, well, I'll just let the kids die. That's too big. It's too overwhelming. Kids die every day. It's West Africa done and dusted. And obviously that solution is a straight up, not only moral and ethical disaster, but it is a bad grade. Okay. So if, if, if that's, if that is a solution that you think you can come up with, then you need to think again, and you may need to check your morals and ethics. I, I'm not sure. So that is unacceptable. The next solution is is minimally better, but it's still not great. So I would say, again, he's put me in this position where I am the leader of a coup that has just overthrown a democratically elected president. The, a president who, by the way, had just gotten reelected to his second term. And a president who had increased military funding at, at least doubled, maybe even tripled military funding in his second term. The problem has been that the military funding is not is being mismanaged. So the troops aren't being housed. The troops don't have good equipment. The troops aren't feeling at, um, aren't being trained, even though the amount of money they've been getting is increasing. So the, the military has this coup. We kick him out of office. Well, the problems uh, here are that the West African states, which are kind of a big block that are together, kind of like the EU or NATO or something like that, they can't support a coup. That you can't, or you can't go around and support the military overthrowing a democratically elected government. But there is also obviously issues going on in Burkina Faso that need to be addressed. So. Um, I would try to I would try to get the West African states to um, try to get the West African states to agree to humanitarian aid in Burkina Faso while we set up elections for the summer of 2022. And I would hope that that would go. But do you see how that problem just kind of stops and hinges on a bunch of assumptions and stuff like that? That's why that's a lame answer to that problem. Okay. Does everyone see why my second, I mean, you, I think you understand why my first answer was bad. You understand why my second answer is bad. Okay. So how can we 
improve that. So in this scenario, if I receive, let's say I'm in your position, I receive a question that I feel is not great. Let's, let's game that out. What, what do we do from that position? So if you have a question like that, I think you need to go to the questioner and start to have them reframe that in a different way. What, what is the real problem in Burkina Faso? Well, I'm, you know, whoever did the research on Burkina Faso knows that that was a coup, but they should also have a pretty good understanding of why that coup happened. And what really happened was a breakdown of democratic institutions. That's why the coup happened. So really a better question about Burkina Faso is about the, the failure of democratic institutions to serve the people they're designed to serve. So to reframe the question at a larger level and ask about the role of democratic institutions, how can you improve democratic institutions in a country that has no wealth how can the international community help strengthen democratic um, institutions? So it's possible, and I think this is not only possible, but I think it's probably what you would end up having to do is empower the person who's reading the question to be the general secretary of the United Nations, right? Or the leader of the economic West African states. Empower them to be that person so that they are in charge of a supranational corporation and can't, or uh, not corporation, entity, institution, and they can then deal with helping to firm up uh, institutional structures and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Like that's a better question. Creating some sort of, if your particular, if your least developed country is struggling with coups, is struggling with institutional level things and find a way to come up with questions or situation that, that addresses those larger issues. Another thing that I think we should emphasize is that when you write your questions, you need to be cognizant of the reality that exists right now. When we did our semester exams, we invented things like diseases and mosquitoes and all kinds of stuff. You, right, we are limiting you to what is a real problem that a real country, real people are facing, and you're coming up with avenues to create solutions to that problem. All right, so to do, and now we're still recording, but I do want that to be kind of a Q&A with you all that for the benefit of other classes, obviously, but are there things that can be clarified, need to be clarified at either the question writing stage or the solution, coming up with the solution stage, any of that? Yes, Dan. Is it always necessary to speak a I don't know that it's always necessary. It is certainly helpful, and I guess it, in some regard, will depend on what you come up with. Yeah. But I would say, now that I'm thinking about it for a split second, it's, it's, it, I would do it just to help your classmate out, right? Just to give them a... It narrows the yeah. scope of their involvement. Think it, it, it'd be beyond a nice thing to do. It'd be... It would allow them the best chance of success. Correct. That is a good question. We had not worked that into the timeline. I don't know. I'm just like, what if someone is just like, this country is in war? This other country is in What if, what if we are not going to necessarily go around and check every single person's questions? If you receive questions that you feel could be um, 
elaborated upon and you're maybe not comfortable it's like it's a okay question you don't want to like offend a classmate or something and you want to say like hey what do you think about this question come talk to uh kirk here my, my class uh, come talk to us and then we can address the question itself um, with you or on your behalf or something but we're going to assume for the most part that everyone's going to have at least a reasonable question until we have reason to understand they don't it may be i haven't looked and since i turned on the recording thing i can't get to that other screen but i wouldn't be surprised um Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna articulate this. I think I sort of said it at the beginning, but I think it might be better if I say it in a in a clearer way now. You are going to receive. This is like the first week in April. We come back from spring break at the end of that week. By then, you should have your ten problems. And again, just like Luna said, if you want us to check a a, a problem or you you know whatever, that's fine. We're glad to do that. You are then going to pass off your 10 problems to another person. And that's when they start working and researching their stuff. And they're going to do, they're going to need to have uh, solid answers to all 10. Right. I like, I spent 45 minutes on the USA thing alone, and I feel like I just scratched the surface. Right. I should, could have spent more time on restorative justice. I could have given programs that exist in that, et cetera, et cetera. And so you will need to really have it all laid out for all 10. And the reason is, is because at the end of April, you're going to come up and you're going to present two of the 10. And I don't, I don't even know that Klein and I care, really, do we? And so you, when, you know, so when Addie comes up to present, she can pick what she feels are her two strongest. She presents those two. And, and if she's good and we feel like that's good and done and dusted, then she's done. She's achieved the end of the year project. This is the end of the school year project. It is not your final exam, but it is worth a massive amount of points in the fourth nine weeks that kind of set you up for success not only in the class, but we'll help with the AP exam and stuff as well. I mean, it'll be, it'll be beneficial to you. It'll still, and obviously it'll be the last major grade we take because the AP exam will be the next week. So if, you know, let's say then Jack comes up and he's done his 10 and he presents two, but one of them is a little bit iffy. We didn't feel great about it. Where like last semester, we gave you a like a 10 minutes to go fix it, right? This time it's going to be like, well, you have eight more to choose from. You better be good. Yeah. So you, you did solution one and solution two. What's solution three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Right? You have all of those to make up. That's wonderful. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Yeah. Lena. Correct. Correct. So no, so so, Marion, what were your your two countries? Yeah, you're highly developed and you're low, least least developed. Okay. Okay, so let's just so so let's say Mar so Marion's going to give you her two countries. She's going to give you Germany, and let's just say her least developed country was uh, Burkina Faso. Okay, she's going to give you everything she has on those countries plus ten questions. Yours was Singapore and what? 
Australia. You're going to give Annabelle everything you have on Australia and Singapore, plus your 10 questions. Annabelle, what were yours? Republic of Congo and Italy are going to go to Abby, plus your 10 questions. Okay? And we're just going to kind of move through the room that way. And so when, when Annabelle gets Luna's stuff, she is answering Luna's problems, dealing with Luna's countries. Okay? She, she's 100% on board. Like, so in other words, by the end of this project, you should have really strong familiarity with four countries. The two you did and the two who you solved problems from. Okay. All right. Other questions or comments about this? The timeline unofficially starts today, as I think we'll be answering some questions still and stuff like that. But really starting the next week, we'll give you time to start putting together uh, your your research and your questions. And this is this is also if you feel like your research on again, you know, not trying to call anyone out, but if you had say you had the Democratic Republic of Congo or you had Nigeria or you had Burkina Faso, if you feel like that research is not going to help your, your comrade out over next week and the week after spring break would be the time to fluff up your research. Do you have to do that? No. Would your classmate greatly appreciate it if they were handed a folder that was as thorough as could be? Yes. Does that make sense? We will never know if you do that. What we are going to grade are your 10 problems and your responses to those. That's all we're ever going to see. Correct. Two of your answers, we grade 10 of your problems. So you grade all 10 of them? Yeah, we'll grade the 10 problems, right? I'll see the 10 things that you did. And I will grade that as, that is, that's one stream of a grade. I don't, don't ask me how many points it is. We haven't discussed that yet. But it'll be a significant number of points. So that's stream A all 10. But then in stream two is your response to Abby's. So Abby's going to give you her 10. We're going to grade you on your response to Abby's questions, but we're going to then look at your questions that you give Jack. Does that make sense? And sorry. Yes. Five and five. Yeah, five from country A and five from country B. Right. Yeah, you will supplement the research. The research they give you will mostly be an introduction to their country. But then the problem that you're solving is going to require research on this specific problem. For instance, if somebody had, like if Klein had done Burkina Faso, what he really would have given me was all the demographic information and all of the sort of political background information on Burkina Faso. Like he, I mean, he said all that stuff at the beginning, right? He kind of gave some background on Burkina Faso. That's what he's giving me. But then I'm going to have to do the research on the stuff, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, fifteen. Yes, the two solutions are going to be a grade, and the ten problems are going to be a grade. So, sometime around the last week. So we come back after spring break. And like that Thursday or Friday, whichever the A day is, when we come back from spring break, we're going to want to look at your 10 problems, right? So it's like the 28th or 30th or something like that. We're going to actually kind of, we'll say grade, I guess, grade, evaluate, that's a better word, evaluate your 10 problems. 
Um, and after we evaluate those problems, if there needs to be some tweaks on the problems, then you go back and tweak them. But by April 1st, or again, I don't know the exact day, but you know, like that first Monday or first A day in April, you will pass off your, your 10 to whoever we tell you to pass it off to. Uh, the very last week in April, like the 29th and 30th. So like the, the last the, th the last Thursday and Friday of April. Okay. Well, we also, I mean, this will probably bleed over into the Monday and Tuesday of the next week. But I think the Wednesday, that Wednesday is a human geo test. There will be no final exam as long as you meet the criteria of absences and uh, to the C or better, I think, in terms of your so, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to stop.